Welcome once again to Lato's Law. Here's Steve Lato. This video might be a tad longer than usual, but it's a great case. It's another case out of Virginia. My good friend Ross, who sent me the story about the court ruling on the RV that went bad and all the disclaimers that were in the purchase agreements. Well, he sent me a note to Steve, got another case here out of Virginia. You're going to want to see this one. It's called Maisie Green versus Portfolio Recovery Associates, okay? So Green is the, is the appellant here, and Portfolio Recovery is uh, the other party to this. And they are somebody who does debt collections. They buy up debt, uh, and then they pursue the debtors, and they, and they chase them around and try to get money from them. And uh, Green here argued that Portfolio Recovery came into court and couldn't prove that the debt they had bought was hers. And now she lost at the lower court, but she appealed, and the appeals court said, wait a second, you kind of do have to prove that you've got the correct debt, and there were problems here. And so they spun this around, they threw out the uh, judgment that Portfolio had gotten, and they said that uh, Green could cons continue with her lawsuit because she wanted to sue them for violation of the uh, Federal Debt Collection Practices Act. So... She was pro se, by the way, uh, as representing herself, appealing a court order from the circuit court that was in favor of portfolio recovery in a debt collection action. The circuit court granted judgment to them in the amount of $8,900. On appeal, Green argues that PRA did not have standing to sue, that the court made a mistake by failing to consider her counterclaim, alleging that PRA filed, uh, violated the Fair Debt Collections Practices Act, and that by releasing her cash bond to PRA, the District Court of Allegheny County violated the 14th Amendment and the FDCPA by issuing a recognizance on behalf of the debt collection agency. Finding the PRA failed to prove it owned the debt, we reverse the circuit court's decision. So this is good news for people who are being hounded years and years and years and years later on a debt where somebody goes, you owe us this money. And you say, prove it which you're allowed to do. And they go, now we'll see you in court. Uh, so in December of 2020, uh, PRA is a debt buyer. They filed a warrant in debt against Green in General District Court, alleging she had defaulted on a credit card debt that was owned by somebody else with an original account number ending in 7068 and a balance of $8,900. That account number ending in 7068 is important because the documents that they have in court have a weird jump in the numbers, and it's unclear if the debt they were chasing is the same one they were collecting. PRA asserted that it was the assignee of the debt. In support of its claim, it filed a bill of particulars, which had the following documents attached. A letter from PRA to Green listing the original creditor as a bank and an original account number ending in 7068. Then they attached a September 2010 document labeled Bill of Sale from the bank to another bank. And then an August 2013 document labeled Bill of Sale from that bank to another bank. And then a July 2018 document labeled Bill of Sale from that bank to another bank. And so notice that one of these documents dates back to 2010 and the lawsuit's being filed in 2020. So... We won't, we won't get too heavily into that because the court doesn't address that as much. There's also a June 2019 document labeled Bill of Sale from that last bank to PRA. Then there's a two-column spreadsheet for an account number ending in 7068 with Green's name, but no creditor name, no headings identifying the source or purpose of the document, or means of trying uh, to figure out if these bills of sale are all related to each other. But on August 2020, uh, a declaration of a custodian of records for PRA stated, according to the records transferred to the account assignee from account seller and maintained in the ordinary course of business by the account assignee, there was due and payable from Maisie Green to the account seller the sum of $8,900. So this company has filed an affidavit saying, yep, it's correct. The affidavit stated that this finding was based upon a review of the business records of the original creditor and those records transferred to PRA from a bank which had become a part of and have integrated into PRA's business records in the ordinary course of business. You might wonder, what's with that language? Well, 
if a person is testifying about something, they must have personal knowledge of it. And one of the things that you can testify to, like if you have a big business and you need someone to go into court and testify about something that the business knows, well, if somebody is in a position where they work in the company and they handle records in the ordinary course of things, they can testify to that. So that's what their, their language is just mimicking what they think needs to be there. A synchrony bank pricing information addendum, which identified this as a PayPal credit account ending in 7068. And then also monthly PayPal billing statements spanning July 2017 to September 2018, listing a customer named Maisie Green and an account number ending in 8616. So somewhere, the account number changed, and there's no explanation for that. The bills of sale did not mention any specific debtor names or account numbers or include any attachments with that information. None of the bills of sale listed Green's name or account number. Additionally, transfer agreements identifying which specific accounts were sold were not attached to any bill of sale. PRA's, customer, uh, <clears throat> PRA's custodian of records claimed that such records, which perhaps identified Green or any accounts, were confidential. The PayPal billing statements show that someone named Maisie Green last used the account in 2018 and that the last payment on the account was in also 2018. So in response to the complaint... Green filed a grounds of defense asserting that PRA lacked standing to sue her because it had not produced evidence of chain of title to prove its ownership of the debt. So she said, look, they're suing me. They can't prove that that debt refers to me. Therefore, they have no right to sue me. Prior to this, Green had asked repeatedly for the debt to be validated. Green also filed a counterclaim for $1,000 under the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. She argued that PRA violated the act by not reviewing their business records or ones they had been allegedly assigned. They also were robo-assigned, she said. And uh, she said they attached a deceptive, misleading, and undated letter to the warrant in debt, informing her that a lawsuit had been filed. She also sought a declaratory judgment that PRA violated the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. In uh, April of 2021, Green got a continuance in the district court because she said she'd received no response to her request. And then she appeared for trial in May. At trial, PRA said they were not prepared for trial because of Green's letter, and their witness was not there. So they decided to do this in 2021. The General District Court conducted a hearing then and ruled in favor of PRA and dismissed Green's counterclaim. The General District Court set an appeal bond of $8,900, which she posted when she appealed the ruling to the Circuit Court. So it went from District Court to Circuit Court to the Court of Appeals in Virginia. Green moved for summary judgment in the circuit court, asserting that PRA lacked standing. She informed the court that the original account ending number was 7068, but PRA provided the court with a PayPal credit statement account number ending in 8616. She argued that PRA had no valid proof of assignment, no proof the original account number ending in 7068 changed it to an account number ending in 8616, and had no contract for one of the banks ending in 7068. She claimed that she was therefore entitled to judgment as a matter of law. Now, the circuit court denied her motion. The circuit court held a bench trial. And there, somebody came in and testified from PRA, uh, testified that the account being sued upon ended with 7068. She then testified that each bill of sale was accurate and complete, but also that no bill of sale included any attachments. When asked why the transfer agreements identifying which specific accounts were sold were not attached, she said that the specific accounts were confidential because they contained other individuals' names and account numbers. And, of course, you could have redacted those things, but eh, it'd probably take a lot of time because you'd have to get like an El Marco or a Sharpie and redact. Meanwhile, Green submitted into evidence PRA's notice of filing of a warrant and debt. She also submitted an email conversation she had with an attorney from PRA in that exchange, she asked the attorney why the account number differed from the original account number. And the attorney responded, since the account was sold to other creditors numerous times, I do not have a record of the exact time the original account number was changed. The attorney recommended that Green contact the bank for more information. And that, would, of course, would be one of the banks that sold off her debt. So she's not even a customer anymore. PRA sought to introduce an affidavit from a person who said... Um, they were from Synchrony Bank, one of the banks in this chain of title. The affidavit stated that Green was issued a credit card account with an account number ending in 8616 in 2018. 
that the account number was changed from 8616 to an account ending in 7068. The affidavit also attested the account was sold to PRA in 2019 and that the bank records documented the sale. After hearing the party's evidence and arguments, the circuit court ruled for PRA. So the court then ordered the bond to be released to PRA, so they got their money. And now Ms. Green has filed an appeal with the Court of Appeals of Virginia. So this is the state Court of Appeals. She argues that PRA could not recover from her because they failed to prove it owned her debt. Court wrote, we agree. PRA is a debt buyer. The debt buying industry has exploded recently. The growth in this industry has inevitably led to litigation. Courts around the country have been compelled to confront these practices. Virginia courts have little precedent related to debt buying, so we can rely on cases from other jurisdictions and secondary sources to provide a framework and backdrop to better understand the industry. The debt buying industry works in the following manner. First, a creditor and a consumer enter into a contract by which the creditor or a bank extends credit to the consumer, often through a credit card, in exchange for a promise to be repaid later. When a consumer falls behind on repaying a creditor, the creditor often charges off the debt as unrecoverable and sells the rights to recover the debt to a debt buyer who specializes in collecting delinquent debts. The debts are sold usually bundled into portfolios of many accounts, which the debt buyer purchases at pennies in the dollar compared to the face value of the collective debt owed. The debt buyer then either attempts to collect debt or resells the debt to another debt buyer. Many debts are purchased and resold several times over the course of years before either the debtor pays the debt or the debt's owner determines the debt can be neither collected nor sold. Debt buying has a role to play in the consumer lending industry. Debt buying can reduce the losses that creditors incur in providing credit, thereby allowing creditors to provide more credit at lower prices. So there's nothing wrong with the practice, but in the course of a debt being sold several times, documentation of information about the debt is often lost. In a study, the Federal Trade Commission found that while buyers receive some information about the debt they are purchasing, most portfolios did not include any documents at the time of purchase, and only a small percentage of portfolios include any documents, such as account statements or the terms and conditions of credit. Without adequate documentation, debt buyers can have trouble proving in court that they own the debts they seek to collect. Some debt buyers get around this by having employees sign affidavits for hundreds or thousands of debts per day, attesting personal knowledge of the facts of each case, despite the impossibility of verifying the information for that many accounts that quickly. And of course, that's referred to as robo-signing. Even for debt buyers acting in good faith, documentation is only a problem if the debt buyer is in fact forced to prove it owns the debt. And what they get at here is that a vast majority of these, when they track somebody down, they simply file a lawsuit. And many people won't answer the lawsuit. So it never gets to the stage where the debts are examined and the paperwork is examined. So they get a default judgment against somebody, they start chasing them to make them pay the default judgment. And so here, this woman actually said, no, I want them to prove that they've got the correct debt and the debt is mine. And they can't do it because they haven't got the proper paperwork. So the number of debts disputed likely understates the lack of information problem because consumers often do not challenge the debts. 90% or more of consumers sued in debt collection actions do not appear, resulting in default judgments. So, in short, debt buying industry practices often result in documentation problems. These very problems are presented in this action. Green raised these issues, and we now address her argument that PRA failed to prove it owned her debt. Green frames her argument as a question of PRA's standing to sue. She argues that because they failed to prove it owned a debt she owed, it lacked a personal stake in the outcome. And generally speaking, for you to file a lawsuit, you have to have standing. You've got to be somebody who is invested in the underlying controversy. And so if somebody comes along and goes, she owes money, well, the only person who can sue her for that is the people that she owes the money to, either the original creditor or, or someone they've assigned the debt to. And some people are going to ask about that. And they're going to say, Steve, I hear this all the time where somebody takes out a mortgage, they buy a car or they take out a credit card loan, 
and the debt gets sold. Is that legal? Number one, yes. It's been legal for a long, long period of time that lenders can sell the debts to other people. Now, you might say, but Steve, that doesn't seem fair. Well, if you read the contract you signed, it says they can do that. So when you buy a car and the loan is going to get assigned to somebody else, it says right there, we have the right to assign this loan to somebody else. Likewise, probably with your mortgage and also probably with all the credit card uh, contracts you've ever signed. So the court gets into this whole thing about who has got standing to sue and points out that there's a federal statute, the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, which requires debt collectors to do certain things. And so if a borrower says, I want you to validate the debt, they have to give you information, which is the amount of the debt, the name of the creditor to whom the debt is owed, a statement that unless the consumer within 30 days after receipt of the notice disputes the validity or any portion thereof, the debt will be assumed to be valid. A statement that if the consumer notifies the debt collector in writing within 30 day period, the debt or any portion of it is disputed, the debt collector will obtain verification of the debt or a copy of the judgment. And a statement that upon the consumer's written request within a 30 day period, the debt collector will provide the consumer with a name and address of the original creditor, if different from the current creditor. Once that information is provided, the consumer has 30 days to dispute the validity of the debt. If the consumer notifies the debt collector, then the debt collector must cease collection of the debt. PRA asserts ownership of this debt through a series of assignments. When pursuing an action on a contract or instrument assigned, an assignee stands in the shoes of the assignor. They have no more rights. They have no fewer rights. They have the exact rights that were assigned to them. Okay? The Supreme Court has long held that a party seeking to prove ownership of a contractual right by assignment bears the burden of proving that the assignment occurred. So a debt buyer may introduce several forms of evidence to prove ownership. PRA sought recovery on breach of contract and account stated theories for a debt based on a written contract. The best evidence rule requires that the contents of the writing are desired to be proved. The writing itself must be produced or it's in its absence uh, sufficiently accounted for before evidence of its contents can be admitted. Otherwise, good copies are acceptable, that kind of thing. And it says a debt buyer must then introduce evidence to prove that it has been assigned to that original contract or account between creditor and debtor. For debt buyers, available documentation typically includes the purchase and sale agreements between each assignor and assignee in the chain of title, along with the files listing information on the specific accounts transferred from assignor to assignee. And so here what they're getting at is what they do in the industry is they say, do you want to buy 100 debts? Face value, $100,000. Sell it to you for ten grand. Okay, and what they give them is a list just with line items, and each line item is a debt. But there should be the accompanying documents to support it. But apparently nobody bothers to do that because you don't need to because 90% of the people who get sued don't answer. So the 90% you go after, the 10% who answer, well, it's a bit of a pain, but you deal with that when you get there. So here we've got a problem because PRA came into court and didn't have any of these documents. Who owes the debt and who legally can collect the debt must be stated clearly in the documentary evidence. Random spreadsheets with numbers do not meet the burden to prove who owns the right to recover a debt. A bill of sale must contain all the information and attachments to authenticate the debt. At a minimum, the bill of sale must identify the debtor and the amount of debt owed, the debt cannot be authenticated if there's no information in the bill of sale that identifies the person or company regarding the details of the debt. So there's literally 17 or 18 pages going through this, but basically it comes down to with the documents unable to support the chain of title or even the existence of the initial agreement, which would help, that leaves the affidavits and testimony through which PRA sought to tie the documents together. PRA introduced as a trial exhibit an affidavit signed and dated the day before trial by a senior media affidavit representative who attested that based on his review of bank records, the defendant was issued a credit card account ending 8616, the account was changed to a number ending 7068, and the account was sold to PRA in 2019. PRA also presented a custodian of records as a trial witness who testified that the two-column spreadsheet with the account number ending 7068 
was produced near the time of the sale, she did not testify that Green's specific name and account number were part of each assignment, which, of course, she could not because, as custodian of records at PRA, she could at most have personal knowledge of the transaction between Synchrony and PRA, and she testified only that for each of the four bills of sale, the transfer agreement that would presumably list the specific account numbers transferred could not be produced because they were confidential. So on balance, in the light most favorable to PRA, that affidavit and other testimony show only that one bank's information for an account ending 8616 in this woman's name was changed to one ending 7068, and the account was sold to PRA. So there's all kinds of gaps in the testimony. Again, it's a said uh, 24 pages long. So I'm not going to get through all of this because I ain't got that kind of time, and I don't think you do either. However, the court found that PRA failed to prove ownership of this debt. What they gave the court was not there. Now, I know some people might think, go, oh, wait a second, Steve. If you were defending this case and the debt collection company wasn't expecting it, maybe they kind of got ambushed and just didn't, you know, didn't have time to prepare. Well, no, because remember, there were a couple of adjournments on the first case in district court. Then when it was appealed to circuit court, the circuit court actually held another trial. At that point in time, the Portfolio Recovery Associates had had all the time in the world to prepare their case, get all their ducks in a row, whatever documents they needed, and they couldn't produce the documents that were supposed to accompany each transfer. All they had was an affidavit from somebody going, business records kept in the usual course of business, and that's what this is. Okay, where are the documents that are supposed to support each debt as it transfers? And so what this case is, particularly in Virginia, but other states, if this happens to you, you could point to this as persuasive because the way the debt buyers work, we've talked about this, is they buy a bunch of debts at one time in a portfolio. It could be 100, it could be 1,000 different debts they buy. And what they get is a spreadsheet that lists a name, social security number, possibly last known address, the amount of a debt, and possibly who the original debtor was. But those spreadsheets then get resold and resold. And I've heard of stories from people who said, I paid somebody off, and somebody else says, well, I just bought that debt. It's mine now. Well, I paid them off. Now you got to pay me. There's no record of that. So it gets sloppy. And that sloppiness is not the fault of the debtor. Did this woman have a credit card that never got paid? Don't know. Don't know. Okay, but some people are going to go, but Steve, she probably did. She might have. She might have, but if they want her to pay the debt, they've got to be able to prove that they're holding the debt legally, and that includes a chain of title. And so if I told you I was going to sell you a house and your title search company came back and said, hey, there's a huge gap in the chain of title. Oh, just buy the house anyway. <laughs> no. You look at me and go, you know, the seller might not own that house. And so when somebody comes into court and says, I've got this spreadsheet that says you owe us money. And I go, I've never met you before. Oh, no, I bought this from somebody. They sold it to me. Okay, you bought a spreadsheet from somebody. Can you show me the documentation to prove that you actually legally have got that in your hand? Because if you don't have that, it could wind up being a situation like I just described where they get the money from you and somebody else goes, no, we had the paper. No, we had the paper. Who is holding the paper? Legally, who's got the right to collect on it? So this court said that she was right, that PRA never proved they had standing and never proved they had the right to collect the debt, which is why they don't have standing. So they spun that part around and they sent it back down to the trial court and said, look, you've got to consider the facts of the case to see, because she might be right. And if the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act is violated here, then PRA owes her $1,000. And she owes them nothing. So it's an interesting case. And like I said before, I know a lot of people in this field, in this industry, who defend people who are being chased for debts. And the stories I hear are incredible. And one of the things I often hear about is someone will say, I had a credit card 15 years ago. 15 years ago. And closed the card 15 years ago. 
And someone's chasing you right now saying they're going to sue me. What do I do? And I say, call an attorney who does fair debt collection cases because they can't sue you 15 years later, most likely. Okay? And so the industry has issues. And don't get me wrong. I agree with the court when they said debt buying and transferring actually helps the industry. But if it's done correctly, if it's done correctly. So PRA could not prove that they actually held this debt legally and had the right to collect on it. So she wins the case at the Court of Appeals. And we've talked before about how expensive these things can be to pursue. She was handling this pro se. So I have no idea um, you know, how good her paperwork was. I didn't read her pleadings. But she got a great result from the Court of Appeals of Virginia. The case is called Maisie Green versus Portfolio Recovery Associates, LLC. And the opinion was literally handed down yesterday, sent me by Ross. Thank you very much, my friend. Questions or comments, put them below. Let's talk to you later. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching Lato's Law. Truth is ever to be found in simplicity and not in the multiplicity and confusion of things.